Hi, I'm Lisa. And I'm Nick. And welcome to Under the Covers with Lisa and Nick. I'm really excited for our next guest because he is considered to be the world's top biohacker. Now, he's also an author of numerous books and I was doing some research before this, um, before this interview and when I actually wrote my book, I just sat on the couch in my PJs and ate cookies. But I have to share this gentleman's morning writing routine with you because I was actually quite blown away. Now, he starts his... T- <laughs> He's sitting at his computer, naked, and this is his own words, legs spread wide open in front of a panel of infrared light bulbs, which is designed to stimulate growth hormone, collagen, testosterone. He's got a long tube attached to a nasal cannula, blasting respiratory system with his respiratory system with oxidized water for DNA repair. <laughs> On top of his skull is a photo biomodulation headgear, which is designed to enhance blood flow to the brain while fixing inflammation and fixing neural cells. Beneath his feet was a balance challenging mat and attached to both knees were two tiny electrodes designed to stimulate his muscles as he works in a standing position. Now, I'm a bit worried because I know that- Wait, 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 wait. You said it was sitting and then you said it was standing. Uh, So so I'll I'll correct one, one, one thing about that. I actually stand in front of that red light panel because I actually uh, I don't I don't sit a lot I sit to eat and I sit if I'm on an airplane or in a car but you know if I want my 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 balls to be bathed in the glory of infrared light I gotta stand you know (laughs) well welcome to the show Ben Greenfield (laughs) thanks and that that's a very interesting introduction I I I should clarify like you know there there's all these different so-called biohacking modalities you could spend your whole day just effing around with, with all sorts of stuff. And so, you know, if, if I, if I can do five things at a time while I'm working on an article or a book, um, and honestly, if I just walk into my office and flip on, you know, on everything you just mentioned, it's kind of like brushing your teeth. It's not like I'm spending like hours every day. It, it, well, let me put it this way. It's kind of funny. Like, you know, in the anti-aging and longevity sector, there's these people who, you know, just do stuff all day long to live a long time, but I don't want to live an extra 20 years if I'm spending an extra 40 years trying to live those extra 20 years, if that makes sense. So, you know, I, I do a lot of the stuff you just mentioned, but I also kind of stack it and just work it into my day. So I'm still pretty hyper productive. I'm not just like infatuated with, uh, you know, shining lasers on my testicles all day long. <laughs> oh God. So, well, so that's- actually, you're actually on a treadmill as we speak. So for those listening, Ben's um, getting a little bit of exercise in during this podcast. So I'm just going to jump in with the first question because uh, in this interview, you've got two people who, um, well, one knows so much about biohacking, which is Nick, and I know not that much about biohacking. So uh, just to begin with, can you explain what on earth is biohacking? Well, I, I don't even call myself a biohacker because, okay, so so biohacking, if you really look at, at, the, at the root of it, we're talking about like, you know, for example, deep underground Silicon Valley folks who uh, were referred to their bodies as wetware and as a lot of technology as hardware. And they would install things on their body, like implant a compass in the chest to vibrate every time you face true north or install magnetic implants in the fingertips to be able to interact with screens in the same way that you might see like Tom Cruise doing in the movie Minority Report. Or there's, you know, the story about the guy who had chlorophyll injected into his eyeballs so he could have night vision. Like like all of that I consider to be biohacking. I really don't think like whatever, you know, um, putting fats in your coffee or jumping up and down a trampoline is biohacking, right? That's like cooking and exercise. So really, I'm just a health enthusiast. I'm, I'm not a biohacker in the true sense of the word, but if you were to take the word, which I think has been bastardized in the past several years to just be too broad and expansive of a term, you could say that it's using some sort of science or technology to enhance human biology in some way. Arguably, you might even say, you know, some nutrients, supplements, compounds, smart drugs, et cetera, could be thrown into the mix too. But essentially, it's just figuring a way to get more out of the human body and the human brain using technology or using science or, or even uh, kind of concentrating what you might get in nature using technology. So for example, like Nick and I both have these red light panels next to us. He's got one behind him. I've got one beside me. And those produce the same near infrared and red light that you get from sunlight. But for me to get that big of a dose from sunlight, I, I would have to go out in UVA and UVB radiation 
for a really long period of time. Not that UVA and UVB radiation is bad in small amounts, but I have to spend a lot of time in the sun. Sometimes it's not sunny where I live. Like I'm in Washington state and I'm on a north facing slope out in the forest. So some days I don't get any sunshine, but you know, I would consider, for example, a red light panel to be a biohack that allows me to kind of take those same healing infrared rays, put them in my office, do a quick 10 to 20 minute treatment every day. And that kind of simulates the, the natural effect I get from sunlight. So kind of a, a second way you could think of biohacking would just be taking the stuff you normally get in nature and kind of concentrating it in more intense doses when you can't experience those things in nature or as kind of like the cherry on top of kind of living a more ancestral life. Cause that's what I try to do. I try to live as, as close to nature as possible. And, you know, and, and, you know, I, I hunt, I, I fish, I, I forage for wild plants. I spend a lot of time outdoors. I'm not just like inside hunched over a computer with electrodes attached to me all day long, but I also embrace a lot of the modern science. So I kind of like to have, you know, one foot planted, in the realm of ancestral living and other foot in the realm of modern science. I'm kind of open to, to both approaches. Mate, that leads into my next question. Can you talk about the carnivore diet? Because I noticed you're doing basically a meat diet only for 30 days, nothing but meat. No, that's not true. Oh, really? Um, so, no, I, so I just got back from hunting in New Mexico and I was out there for a week and I was pretty much just eating meat because that's most of what I had. And my body actually felt really good, like really good, like my gut function, my morning poops, my energy levels, everything. Granted, I wasn't doing really glycolytic, like hard workouts, like, you know, the normal stuff I do at home, like high intensity interval training or kettlebell training. So my glycolytic flux, you know, how fast I was burning carbohydrates wasn't quite as intense. So I didn't really need like, you know, bread, rice, grains, potatoes, etc. And I was engaged in low level physical activity all day long. So I, so I was kind of almost doing like a keto carnivore type of approach during that hunt. Yeah. And I came back and I thought, you know what, I, I did it for a week, I might as well just kind of keep this up for 30 days or so and see how my body feels. But you know, but my, my version of that means that I'm eating kind of a nose to tail carnivore type of diet. So a lot of organ meats, a lot of bone broths, a lot of bone marrow, a lot, a lot of the nutrient dense sources of an animal that go way above and beyond just the fibrous meat component because, you know, meat is, it's a little bit nutritionally dense, but when you're eating the entire animal, you get a lot more nutrition density. So A, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm taking a, a very expansive approach to, to a carnivorous diet. And then I'm also throwing in some things that folks in carnivory might frown upon, but that I think are perfectly acceptable in that context. For example, berries, like small berries, you know, like blueberries, bilberries, black raspberries, huckleberries, you know, a lot of the berries that grow around here. Um, mushrooms, where right? I'm still drinking coffee and putting things like chaga and reishi in my coffee. Um, coffee is not made of meat, we all know, but I'm not gonna- How about your key on amino? Do you need to take your name in the morning? I get my morning cup of coffee. I'm getting so much, so much protein from the meat. I actually kind of stepped back on the amount of Keon aminos I was consuming, even though I love that product. Obviously, I'm just not doing as much of it because I'm eating so much meat. And then um, I'm doing, especially on the days, like the evenings before hard workout days, I'm still eating tubers, which I would argue are kind of like the the most gut friendly and um least problematic form of carbohydrates out there. So a little bit of pumpkin, a little bit of squash, like some of these underground storage organs. Yep. And then a little bit of honey, which arguably is an, an animal based source of carbohydrates. Um, and uh, yeah, aside from that, you know, that's pretty much my approach. So it's kind of like a carnivore ish approach, more of a keto carnivore approach with a few extra things thrown in. And I feel pretty good. The only thing I would say is I have noticed because Sometimes I'll do some pretty glycolytic workouts that have surges that exceed like two minutes in duration, you know, like an airdyne workout where I've got whatever, you know, six or seven, two minute hard efforts on the bike. Yeah. And I have found like I'm a little bit flatter during those efforts because I know I'm not eating as many carbohydrates, but at the same time, I mean, from cellular autophagy, you know, the, the body's natural cleanup process to uh, some of the mental stability, staving off some of the inflammation that occurs from frequent blood glucose rises, and also just kind of giving the gut a break from a huge amount of fiber or a huge amount of, you know, plant defense compounds. Um, I just, you know, I, I like to experiment sometimes. I just figured I'd do it for 30 days and 
see how my body feels. And so far I feel, I feel pretty good. And I mean, who can complain about having ribeye steak for breakfast? <laughs> oh my God, that sounds wonderful. Well, can I ask you, when I do research on things like say, for example, I'm not sleeping well, or, you know, I'm looking to do something for anti-aging, there's so much information out there and there's so much information that contradicts other information. How do you decide what you actually try and what you believe? Well, when I'm standing there in front of those lights naked in the morning, as you've already alluded to, a lot of times I'm reading research. I read a ton of research, typically anywhere from five to 20 different, you know, PubMed articles per day, subscribe to a lot of journals. You know, I'm constantly pouring over what the actual research says, not just epidemiological research and observation of, you know, how, how the successful diets of certain populations around the world are comprised or, or put together, but then also research on specific molecules, nutrients, supplements, you know, for my company, Key On, I'm, I'm doing a lot with the formulations over there. So I'm constantly kind of having to be nosed down in the literature. So I, I, I pay a lot of attention to what science says. And I, I also uh, look with a very skeptical raised eyebrow at what media says, you know, for example, uh, red meat is bad for you. Well, yeah, if you look at, at large, population studies of people who eat a ton of red meat they're also doing like you know burgers vegetable oil watching football for four hours sitting with their feet up drinking beer like you know that's the typical red meat crowd somebody who's like whatever bow hunting their own wild game and eating the animal nose to tail and eating a you know in a really healthy way physically active incorporating fasting and you know even thinking about eating mindfully and eating with other people and avoiding vegetable oils and sugars and things like that that does a totally different context of red meat so i mean that's one media study where you got to dig a little bit more into the data to see what population they actually studied or there's other studies where i mean like 80% of the research out there on nutrition is done in males, not females, right? But sometimes you read an abstract of a paper and you won't know that. So you gotta dig a little bit, little bit more into the study and say, okay, well, was this on mice? Was it on rodents? Was it on fruit flies or yeast? Was it on, uh, it was, was it on women? Was it on men? So, um, you know, I, I got my master's degree in physiology and biomechanics from University of Idaho. And I, I use that, that base understanding of microbiology and biochemistry and chemistry and what I studied there to advise me a little bit in terms of, of the advice that I give out or the way that I treat my own body. I pay attention to a lot of research articles. I read a ton of books. And then as we were just discussing, I'll sometimes just guinea pig stuff, right? Like try out a certain diet and see how it feels. Because I, I, don't, I don't completely snub my nose at A, anecdotal evidence. Like if somebody feels really good on something, I'll look into something even if there's not double-blinded human clinical research behind it. Or B, I also don't discount some of the so-called, you know, ancient wisdom. Like, you know, if, if some herb has been studied in traditional Chinese medicine for thousands of years and found improved gut function, but hasn't had a, you know, a Harvard health research behind it, or, you know, some Ayurvedic protocol that uh, recommends a, a certain approach like, avoiding too much spicy and hot food based on your Ayurvedic constitution or something like that. I don't necessarily discount, you know, some of that ancient wisdom that we might get from, from Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine or something like that. Again, even if there's not a lot of published research behind it, I'll also pay attention to just like, you know, what people have done successfully for thousands of years. And, you know, I, I don't discount that per se. Mate, I noticed you're a massive fan and please correct me if I'm wrong of stem cell therapy. Um, I think you did a post a few months back where you injected stem cells into yourself. Uh, and I think last week or the week before you did ox um, ozone therapy into your knees. What are your thoughts around that area around stem cells, ozone therapy for joint pain and arthritis? Well, that's apples and oranges, ozone and stem. You know, ozone is more of kind of an anti-inflammatory tactic. If injected into a joint, it'll kind of spark up a little bit of an inflammatory response, attract white blood cells and other healing factors to an area. And it can be pretty successful in treating, you know, chronic inflammation or joint issues, et cetera. Uh, ozone is also, you know, if you drink ozone water or do like, let's say, you know, rectal insufflation or ear or nose insufflation of ozone, that's something used quite a bit in functional medicine. Um, Again, primarily for either an antibacterial, antiviral, or antimicrobial effect, or when injected into joints yep. to kind of help out with, with the healing of a joint or to reinitiate an inflammatory response so that a joint can then heal properly. Um, and and I, I, I like a lot of the research I've seen in ozone, and you see it increasingly used in 
functional medicine all the way to the point of ozone dialysis, which you might be referring to that as well as a protocol I did recently where you literally filter your blood through ozone. It cleans up a lot of, of microbes. If you have mold, mycotoxins, Lyme, things like that, it can be a successful treatment. And so I really like ozone as a form of, of medicine, for example. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it's a cool, cool thing to look into. I actually bought an ozone generator about six months ago, and I, I use it quite a bit with myself and my family. Um, the stem cells, you know, it, it's interesting because, yeah, I've, I've had my stem cell harvested from my fat and from my bone. So I have some stem cells grown and stored in a lab where if I get in a car accident, get a serious concussion or TBI, have a pretty significant joy issue, I can inject my own stem cells, which arguably are going to be the most compatible with my body into yeah. my system. And I, I think that's good insurance if you can afford to do something like that. I don't, I don't think it's top of the totem pole as far as, as self-care, but it's interesting to have some on hand just in case you needed them. Uh, arguably, they might also be biocompatible with my children. So if they got very injured, they could use some of my stem cells as well. Now, a lot of practitioners will use what's called non-autologous stem cells, which means they're coming from umbilical sources or amniotic sources, et cetera. Those are less expensive. And it appears now when you combine them with a, with a special signaling molecule called exosomes, they can be because these exosomes help the stem cells to go to the body, to the specific areas where they're needed that the non-autologous stem cells combined with the exosomes could be just as effective as autologous stem cells or using your own stem cells. Um, you know, and I've experimented quite a bit with stem cells and, and looked into them quite a bit. Um, they, they are kind of like overpriced and overhyped right now. I think a lot of docs are making a lot of money using umbilical or amniotic stem cells, which aren't that expensive, and injecting them into patients or delivering them intranasally for, you know, for head injuries, et cetera. And I think Sometimes they overprice them a little bit, but ultimately there is good research for stem cells for joint healing, um, for decreasing the rate of which telomeres shorten, for increasing your bioavailable pool of stem cells, which is going to decrease as you age. I think it's kind of a cool anti-aging hack, but um, you know, based on the expense of it right now, I don't know if it's necessarily uh, – or if it necessarily needs to be like the highest priority for somebody, but it, it's an interesting field. And, and I even went so far in Utah as to, you know, go under anesthesia and do a full body stem cell protocol where they just injected me head to toe with my own stem cells that they extracted from my bone marrow. And I felt really good after that protocol. I still feel like I recover faster. Uh, they did inject my sex organs. So I feel like my sexual performance improved, <laughs> libido, erectile function, et cetera. Uh, my wife has done stem cells as well uh, in her clitoris and her vagina that she harvested from her own back tissue. And she noticed an improvement in libido and orgasm quality as well. So it seems to have a little bit of an effect in the sexual department too. That's great. The thing is, though, what's, so what's better than stem cells? Though? I've, I've, I've harvested my stem cells and injected my joints. What's better on the market that like out there for the for the public to, to utilize? Uh, probably exosomes. Good, just because the exosomes are signaling molecules that will allow your own pool of stem cells to be able to communicate more readily and travel to where they're needed to. They'll increase what's called stem cell mobilization and stem cell communication. And so if you were like getting an exosome injection, that can help out. Exosomes plus stem cells are even better. And then there are certain foods that will just increase your own stem cell mobilization, like uh, colostrum is one, uh, chlorella is another, coffee berry fruit extract. You know, I, I have a whole section of my book where I talk about foods that naturally help out to support your stem cells. So, you know, proper diet and then uh, bioavailability from exosomes, uh, that, those are a couple things that help. Platelet-rich plasma has been around for a while, and that's also something a lot of physicians will use as a less expensive alternative to stem cells, where you just take your own blood out, you spin it in a centrifuge, the growth factors kind of concentrate at the bottom of a vial, and then you can re-inject those into a joint as well, and they'll act kind of, kind of similar to, you know, like the ozone I was talking about as far as uh, accelerating healing of a joint. Yeah. You're gonna I, actually had, uh, I, actually had, sorry, I actually had PRP yesterday and ozone therapy this morning I'm after this. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. devil. You're listening but, um, to the send him broke because he, he buys and does everything. So, do you have some of the things that you want to show Ben that you bought? In my house, I've got literally, you recommended the face mask, got this, man, I've got obviously yeah. um, the Ionic 2 push you talked about recently. Oh, yeah, you're you're drinking the Kool Aid, bro. I'm drinking the Kool Aid. He's absolutely going to go broke. Is that a humidifier in front of you? 
Oh, yeah. Well, the smoke in the air here is really bad. As a matter of fact, the air pollution where I'm at right now because of the wildfires is the worst air quality in the entire world right now out in Washington State. So, you know, I've been taking a lot of vitamin C and fish oil, both of which have some good research behind them for their antioxidant effects against air pollution. But then I'm diffusing this essential oil in my office right now. It's called Respire. It's, uh, was it eucalyptus, frankincense, peppermint, spruce, thyme, rosemary, just a lot of things that can help out with lung health, just as kind of like a little bit of insurance. So I got an air filter running behind me in my office and then these essential oils just because I mean, the air quality is so freaking bad right now. Mate, a question for you. If, if I'm a novice and I know absolutely nothing about health, what are, what are a few things I could do right now to improve my quality of life? Well, let's say you're already, um, you know, uh, it's, it's no secret that you got you, you to gotta have a good movement protocol, right? Walk a lot, lift every once in a while, sprint or play a vigorous sport like tennis or soccer or swimming or something like that. Now, let's say you've already kind of cracked that nut and you're already aware of that, which isn't rocket science. Uh, and then you're already eating a somewhat healthy diet. And I'm not married to any one particular diet. When you look at a lot of the, the healthy characteristics of the world's longest living populations, you find it, it varies from high carb, low fat, to high fat, low carb, you know, to, to different herbs, spices, you know, so what they're eating in Okinawa is going to be different than Sardinia, is going to be different than Loma Linda, it's going to be different than Nicoya, you know, all these blue zones. But you do see prevailing characteristics, right? People fast, they eat in a parasympathetic state, typically gathered with people, they have a wide variety of, of herbs and spices, they, uh, they move a lot, they're outdoors. And so I think you can apply certain dietary characteristics. You know, the other two are, are most of them are very low in processed and packaged foods, low in sugar and low in vegetable oil, right? So no matter what kind of diet you're eating, there's certain principles that you can adhere to. But you know, let's say already moving and eating healthy, I'd say uh, top six things you could do would be, number one, get sunshine every day. If you can't use something like a light panel, but at least 20 minutes, preferably up to an hour of sun exposure every day, just because the infrared light from the sun and even some of the UVB radiation, so important for, for vitamin D, for skin health, for circadian rhythm and sleep rhythms, et cetera. Uh, number two would be to go outside barefoot, even again, for like 20, 60 minutes a day. The, the earth emits these negative ions that are really, really important for stabilizing the, the electrochemical gradient across your cells. And I would say it, it's often undervalued. You know, we walk around in big built up rubber soled shoes. We're largely disconnected from the planet earth. And a lot of people feel really good just throwing in like a 20 to 60 minute walk in the sunshine, trying to get barefoot or, you know, speaking of biohacking, you can buy like little earthing straps or grounding straps. You can put at the bottom of your shoes to kind of keep yourself connected to the electrical frequencies of the planet earth. So that'd be number two. <laughs> no, I've already got it. I've already, I've already got them. Oh yeah. Nick's on Amazon now. Um, and then, uh, I would say heat and cold, like sweating multiple times a week. We know from the Finnish longevity study that you see a marked decrease in mortality, decreased risk of diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, et cetera, when folks are doing a sauna a few times a week. So if you can get some kind of a deep sweat in a few times a week, and then some kind of cold exposure, cold shower at the beginning of the, end of the day, jump into a cold river or lake or ocean or pool. I think heat and cold are often undervalued. And I do a, I do a sauna like three or four times a week for a deep sweat. And then I do a cold shower or a cold soak or something like that almost every single freaking day. And then the last two I would say would be really good, clean, pure filtered water or spring water, or just pay freaking close attention. Your, you know, your blood's 90% water, your lymph fluid's 90% water. And a lot of people just don't get good water in their system or worse yet, they're drinking municipal water that's fluoridated. It's got a lot of chemicals in it. So water filtration is really important. And hand in hand with that is minerals, like using a lot of really good salt, adding trace liquid minerals to your water and really paying attention to minerals because those carry a charge through your body. So in the same way that sunlight charges your body or earthy and grounding charges your body, good water, good minerals is also going to charge your body. So if you're already moving and eating healthy, I'd say sunlight, the planet earth, heat, cold, water and minerals would be the top six things you could do. And, you know, a lot of those can, can be, you know, not very expensive nuts to crack. What are your thoughts on, so throw this in the mix, fasting? So, do you know, for example, a 16, eight or a five, yeah. two, or whatever it may be. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? I mean, like the new Japanese research came out last week. It had like 
40 plus different mechanisms that are beneficial to enhancing longevity and decreasing inflammation all derived from fasting. I was just blown away. I mean, I already knew fasting was good, but, but this paper was, was amazing. And there's a lot of forms of fasting out there, right? Like the, the fasting mimicking diet and alternate day fasting and intermittent fasting and, you know, and, and 16, a, and the list goes on and on. But what I do is uh, 12 to 16 hour intermittent fast every day, which is easy. I mean, you just like finish dinner and don't eat. If you finish dinner at 8 p.m., just don't eat till 8 a.m. Yeah. So usually, usually for me, it's about 14 hours. I'll finish dinner around 8 p.m., eat breakfast around 10 a.m. Uh, and then uh, one or two times a month, I'll just do a dinner time to dinner time fast, right? Where you stop eating Saturday night at dinner, push yourself away. And then you have Sunday night dinner because it appears a lot of the beneficial effects of fasting actually kick in after 16 hours. But nobody's, I mean, especially active people, it's really hard to fast like 16 hours every day. But I'll throw that in just one or two times a month, the dinner time to dinner time fast. And then uh, the last one would be uh, this guy named Walter Longo has a lot of good research on a so-called FMD or fasting mimicking diet, which is super simple. All that means is for four or five days, you eat about 40, 50% or so of the number of calories you'd normally consume. And so I'll treat that as like a quarterly cleanup, right? So anywhere from three to four times a year, I'll just choose a five day time span, do a lot more kind of sauna, yoga, easy walking, and just eat far fewer calories, which is actually pretty simple. You skip breakfast, do a really light lunch, eat your normal dinner. And I mean, that's that's super easy. And, and it's, it's been shown that compared to like just a water only fast or not eating any calories at all, you get a lot of the same benefits, but you're still getting food. You know, you're not, you don't feel like you got to chew your arm off with that approach. So that's what I do is, is intermittent fasting every day, uh, dinner to dinner fast one to two times a month. And then kind of like a quarterly cleanup where I'll just eat fewer calories for about four to five days. Quick question for you. Sorry, Lacey. fast. There's, What's that? There's, there's um, Kino Aminos break your fast because I have it every morning on, when I'm in a fasted state and it helps me train. Yeah. Well, there's, they're not insulin jet. They're not going to spike your blood glucose. I mean, technically there's, there's like one calorie in a gram of it. So yeah, it's, it's like a speed bump. And, and most of the people who fast, who, who come to me and they're like, I fast, but I want to lose, mu lose muscle. I still want to be able to crush a workout. Um, the, the aminos work perfectly for that. You know, you yeah, take five five to 10 grams pre-workout or post-workout and you're still able to crush a fasting scenario but not get too catabolic yeah well unfortunately that's all we have time for so thank you so much ben that was really enlightening i'm going to go on amazon after this and buy those foot straps uh, awesome <laughs> cool please, well, you go uh, fast. i want you to fast please <laughs> what'd you say oh lisa I, I can't see lisa fasting we've been talking about it oh yeah yeah do it lisa do it <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Ben. All right, guys. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it, man. All right. Catch you later. See you, mate.